today will be from Acts 2, 37 through 39. Acts 2, 37 through 39. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all of those who are for all of those whom the Lord our God will call. Would open your Bibles, turn back a little bit from where Ryan read for us. I want us to start this morning in Luke 24, back at verse 44, Luke 24 and verse 44, you recall that over the last couple of weeks we've looked at, as Jack mentioned, uh, we're looking at the subject of baptism and why, why emphasize it and why stress it so much. And uh, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we talked about John the Baptist, right? And we talked about how John came baptizing in the Jordan River. And we remember the scene where Jesus came there and, and um, uh, asked John to baptize him to fulfill all righteousness. And our explanation of that was that um, God wanted Jesus to be baptized and Jesus wanted to please his Father. And so... Uh, John baptized him, a different reason than uh, uh, the, the way others were baptized then and a different reason for which, that doesn't sound good, does it? Huh? Yeah, sounds like rain. New microphone, doesn't work very good. All right, if it keeps going, I'll stop and shout at you. Um, and so... Um, Jesus is baptized, and we fast-forwarded, right? We went three years past past that, and we get to the uh, end of his life. Jesus is crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected, and shortly before he ascends to heaven, we went over last week, Matthew 28, what we call the Great Commission. We call it that because it is a command given and it's one that uh, is perpetual. It applies to you and me today, but it started with, with those uh, 11 men uh, right before the Lord ascended. And we understood that the only way to make a disciple of Christ is through baptizing and teaching. That's what Matthew 28, 18 through 20 does. Now, where we are in Luke chapter 24, it's the same time period. It's at the same same uh, time where Jesus is going about to ascend to heaven. He's already been crucified. He's already been resurrected. Luke is giving us uh, uh, some different words of Jesus in his final time on this earth. And it sets up what we want to take a look at in Acts chapter 2 this morning. So we'll begin, if you will. And I love to see your heads look down at the scriptures uh, instead of looking at me because this is where we... we uh, uh, we look for our authority. Verse 44, he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins, or repentance and forgiveness of sins, would be proclaimed in his name, to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Is this thing still going off? Still making noise? No? Okay, good. Um, sometimes I don't hear what you hear, so just let me know. Shake your head, wave a hand or something. So he's giving them this instruction, and the instruction is... That they need to go, that they need to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins, and that there's going to be a place that it has to start. It's going to need to be in Jerusalem, where they are at this time. He walks them out of town before he ascends. But the command is, you stay in the city uh, until you are uh, given. There it goes. In. Yeah, that's annoying. Is it annoying to you? Yeah. Say yes. I'm coming down to the floor. 
So he has given, he's given him instruction to stay in Jerusalem. They're to stay there until they're given power from on high, which is, of course, a promise that God gave through Christ to give to the apostles. We understand then that this is going to be, uh, uh, they're going to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. And so this is, a, this is setting up Luke's second volume of history, which is the book of Acts. Okay, so flip over to the book of Acts now. As we see this instruction, and we go to Acts chapter 2, where we were just a few minutes ago for our reading. Actually, I want you to go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we notice verses 1 through 8, and Luke begins by saying he's composed his history, and this is the history, verse 2. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these... He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the pro Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. That's Luke 24, 49, where we just were. You see how Luke's sort of dovetailing these together, so we stick up with, stay with the history. And so he says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they were asking him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? He says, it's not for you to know the time or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so we see then these these final words that the Lord is giving to the apostles. And they're to stay in Jerusalem. We know that they're going to be given power. That power comes when the Holy Spirit comes. That's what He's getting across to them, made it very, very clear. And they're to stay there. It's going to happen relatively soon. Now, if you look at your Bible history and you, you add up your numbers and figure things out, you'll understand that from the time that Acts chapter 1 takes place in His ascension, Okay, which we know Jesus was there for 40 days. Then till the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we've got a 10-day period that they're going to wait. Okay, we can look at all that later on, but what I'm letting you know now is there's 10 days in between. So they know they're supposed to wait. In between uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, and when we get to chapter 2, here's what happens, because I, I can't read it all, uh, and that is that Jesus ascends to heaven, takes his place on the throne at the right hand of God, the apostles, while they're waiting in Jerusalem for this power to come, select a new apostle. His name's Matthias. And then in Acts chapter 2, at the beginning of verse 1, we are at the day of Pentecost. This is 10 days after what we just read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And so this is what we read. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And so what do we have here? We have the fulfillment of what the Lord had just told them 10 days earlier, don't we? Uh, they've got power now, and uh, that is that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And when we read about this word tongues, the world throws that into a big old mess. It's not part of our lesson this morning. Suffice it to say, and we can talk about it later, and you can even see it in the context of verse, uh, read verse 6, verse 7, so on. We're talking about languages. These are not people just spouting gibberish and flopping around on the floor the way the world wants to paint a picture. These other languages, they're languages they didn't study, but they were able to speak them fluently. This, of course, would fall in line with the idea of the power coming from the Holy Spirit. So they begin to speak these things. We get over to verse 14 where I want us to pick up, and this is where we have Peter about to preach what we call the first gospel sermon. And you recall that this is Pentecost. The Jews are there from every nation under the world. They've come for this feast there. So there's large crowds there. The coming of the Holy Spirit was loud, and it was not done in secret, and they could see Him come by the evidence of these tongues of fire being distributed upon their head, okay? So Peter stands up to preach, 
in front of this big crowd. And this is what he says, verse 14. Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. So what is it? He says this. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And in the last days, God says, I'll pour forth my Spirit on all mankind. I'm not going to read the whole prophecy of Joel, but he's letting them know this, what you're seeing, what you see and hear, he'll say in a minute, uh, this is what was prophesied. And the Spirit has been poured forth. And that's what you're seeing. At the close of this prophecy, verse 21, he says, It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then that would be a message that the Jews would certainly perk up to and listen to. Everybody, you know. Well, he continues his sermon, verse 22. This is where we start getting to the meat of it. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was not possible for him to be held by its power. Now, what's he saying? He's saying very clearly, Jesus Christ came, and God attested to him. The word is also accredited. You know how sometimes in our colleges or institutions we have accrediting bodies, and what they do is make sure that other people uphold the standard, and when they uphold that standard or they follow a pattern, then they give their accreditation seal. That's what we're looking at here with Jesus. Jesus was able to perform miracles. He said he was the Son of God, God worked miracles through him, and it was proof that he was who he said he was by doing these miracles. And the crowd to whom Peter is speaking knows that he did these miracles. And you can read through the gospel accounts, which we'll do over the next couple years on our Sunday night class, and we're going to see that they watch blind people, right, begin to see. They watch sick people healed. They watch dead people come back to life. They saw that. And yet, what did they do? Mm -mm. He's not who he says he is. And so he talks about David. He gives some information quoting David about um, the Lord always in my presence. He's at my right hand. I'll not be shaken. I, I don't want to spend time on this because we've spent a significant amount of time on it in our Sunday class. The point of it is this, and you read it later to make sure I'm not fibbing to you, okay? The point of it is this that the Jews were thinking there was going to be a physical representation of David to sit on a real throne and and live and rule over a real kingdom in Jerusalem. And Peter's argument is, no, it's not going to be physical. And this is, uh, yes, he is the son of David, but he's not going to rule on a physical throne in physical Israel. That kingdom, this kingdom is not that. It's not physical, it's spiritual, okay? And it's not David, because we can go to his tomb at the time Peter preached it. He said, we can go look at his bones right now. But this Jesus that I'm talking about, he died, and you killed him, and God brought him back from the dead. You go look in his tomb right now, and you can go take a look in there, and it's empty. All right? And so he's making this argument uh, from prophecy to convince this crowd and persuade this crowd of, again who Jesus is. Verse 29, Brethren, I can confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. decay. This Jesus, God raised up to which We are all witnesses. We've seen Him. You've seen Him, right? You remember what we read back there at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. Jesus, after He was resurrected from the dead, He was there for 40 days. And what did He do during those 40 days? Hide from people? Oh, no. He didn't do anything in a corner. And so what was He doing? He was continuing to show who He was 
by the miracles and the signs that He performed. He allowed the disciples to come and say, you know, like Thomas, look, you see the nail prints in my hand. You see the scars. I'm really Him. And I'm really back from the dead. And this is how you can know it. Right? And so for 40 days He did these things. And we find verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. You can't deny what's going on right now. You see it and you've heard it. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, here's, here's some concluding words that are tough, all right, for a large crowd. But Peter boldly says it. Let all the house of Israel know, you fellow Jews, right, know this for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, notice what he says, whom you have crucified. You killed him. You think that would be a tough sermon to hear? Pretty tough to preach, no doubt. But they were guilty. They'd put him on a cross 50 days earlier, nailed him to it, and killed him. Now, what's the proper response to knowing that I'm guilty of putting Jesus on the cross? Did everyone make it? Did everyone listen? Did everyone listen to the sermon that Peter was preaching? They may have listened, but did they all accept it? Let's take a look and see what happens. We find that the crowd says to, to them, uh, says to the apostles, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, or they were wounded in their conscience. It hurt them to hear this message. It was painful. You ever have a sermon preached to you like that? Where it just hits you right here, and you thought, there's no one else that this can apply to as much as it applies to me right now. The sermon hurt. And so what did they do? They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? How can we fix this? I'm guilty of putting the Lord and Christ on a cross. What can we do? What do you think Peter would say? Well, just believe he's the Son of God and go on home. Flip to the back of the Torah. There's a sinner's prayer there. Say that and get out of here. It's not the message we read. What does he say? Peter is answering their question. What must we do? Peter says to them, here's the answer. Repent and be baptized, each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Do you recognize those words from verse 39? As being earlier when this same crowd stood in front of Pilate, and Pilate said to the crowd, why do you want me to crucify him? He hasn't done anything. And the crowd shouts out, his blood be on us and on our children. Same words, right? That adds a little sting in the sermon. Well, the promise is for you, for your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God called Himself, and many other words solemnly He testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. But wait, Peter, I can't be saved. It was chosen ahead of time. Who gets saved or, or who doesn't? I'm sort of stuck. That's not in this book. Don't listen to what the world says. That's what the world says. Peter says, be saved from this perverse generation. Let me ask you, what was their response to this sermon? What did Peter mean by it also? Let's, let's ask, answer that first before we see their response. He says, repent and be baptized. What's the sermon that they just heard? The sermon that they just heard was, He came in front of you claiming to be the Son of God. And He made the blind man to see, blind people to see, and you said, nope, you're not anybody special. You're not the Messiah. He made people well, 
He made crippled people walk. He brought dead people back from life and they looked at him and said, you're not him. You're not the Messiah. Not only that, when the time came, and they worked up into a frenzy, they said, put him on a cross. This man is not him. That's something to repent of, isn't it? As they stood there at this day, listening and grieving. But not only did they need to repent, not only must there be godly sorrow, that godly sorrow has to lead to action as well. You can't continue on in that same path. And so what does he say? He said, not only do you need to repent, you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, let me ask you something. Does that sound like what we read back over in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, that repentance and remission of sins or forgiveness of sins should be preached beginning there at Jerusalem? All Peter is doing here is exactly what the Lord told him to do. He's preaching it. But we see here the way we get that forgiveness of sins isn't by throwing out some, some pre-written prayer written in someone's book. It isn't by simply saying, well, I, I believe that He's Lord and going on and doing nothing. No, it necessitated that they do something and that something is baptism. That's what happens here. And so baptism is it. How did they respond to that? Did they balk at it? Well, I'm sure some did because not everybody there obeyed, just like not everybody obeyed today. But there's 3,000 of them that have been hit by the Word of God. And it's hit them hard. And so in answering the question, in Peter answering the question, notice what their response was in verse 41. So when they had received His Word, what did they do? They were baptized. Don't linger. Fix it right now. I can't, take, I can't take the guilt and the burden of knowing I put God's Messiah upon the cross. Fix it. And so they received His Word and they were baptized, 3,000 of them. And they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Same thing as the Word you read there in verse 41. And so... All those who have believed, verse 44, were together and had all things common. When you see that word believed, our world wants to say that's all you need to do, but understand this, this word believe encompasses everything that we just read about here. They had a heart and a mind to receive God's word. And in receiving that God's word, they allowed it to, to affect them and, and change them, and they repented, and then they were immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. That's what believed means in verse 44. Now that's the context of the day. Verse 47, we find that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day. Notice, those who were being what? Saved. Saved. So, where you and I are today, we bring it forward 2,000 years. And we think about this day. And we think about what they did. I want to submit to you that even 2,000 years later, we stand, mankind stands, in the exact same position as those Jews did that day. When we are guilty of sin, and Paul makes it abundantly clear and elsewhere in the Scriptures that, that we all have done that, right? We're all guilty of it and we fall short. When we hear that, when we hear the preaching of the Word and we understand I'm guilty, we would ask the same question, wouldn't we? Don't we still ask the same question today? Well, what do I have to do? Is there a remedy? How can I fix it? Do you think Peter's sermon to you and me, if he were here in the flesh, would be any different than what it was then? No. He says, repent and be baptized. Now, we understand that repentance is this, and I would say this, until people come to accept Jesus Christ and follow His Word, we're just as guilty as the Jews saying, no, he's, I read about the miracles, doesn't affect me. Or, yes, I, 
I recognize him as being someone special. Doesn't affect me. Look, we better recognize him as Lord and Christ. And if we recognize him as Lord, God, okay, and the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed, God's chosen one to save mankind, when we recognize that, is it really that hard to say, I have just totally missed it and I'm repenting and I'm going to follow you? That's, that's where we go. And you better, you're going to see me run to water. Why? Because getting wet does something? No, no, no. There's a heart here. There's a conscience here. There's intention here. I've repented and I'm submitting. I'm being baptized. I'm allowing that to happen to me because that's what God said. And that's what I want to do. And that's what's required for all people today. And until it is the case that we recognize Jesus as Lord and Christ, Master of our lives, these things, these actions are, are nothing. What happens when we're baptized like that? Now, we got other lessons. I'm just looking right here. Why baptism? Are these made up preacher stuff to try to throw some guilt on you? No, I'm, I'm just taking it from the book. You better take it from the book too. And here's what I read happens when I repent and I'm baptized. And by the way, I'm not going to emphasize baptism over repentance. You're just getting wet if there's no repentance. Right? I take a shower twice a day. I've been swimming. I've done all kinds of things where I'm immersed underwater. We're talking about intention. There's repentance, biblical repentance. And followed up by a biblical action to be obedient to God. That's all kinds of different than the other. What happens there? Well, what I read from this passage and what I think that and what I know that crowd heard, and what I hear is this. Number one, it's for the forgiveness of sins. If I stopped right there, that's enough. Right? Verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Good enough for me. God's taking it away. Get me in the water. But it doesn't stop there. There's a conjunction, and it's connected. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, this is something that was new to the Jews. This isn't something that they got in John's baptism. It's not something that they read about under the Old Covenant, right? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We talk about that later on in some other class. But the Holy Spirit is a blessing that comes with baptism. Not only that, I find out that he says, again in verse, um, where was it? Yeah, verse 40, when he says, be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 40 and also verse 47. I learned that I, I'm, I'm saved when this takes place. And when I look at verse 47, I also see this, that God, the Lord, was adding to their number those who are being saved. I like that God has paid attention uh, to us and that He's adding me to a number of saved people, which means I'm not in the number of unsaved people. It's just one little passage. We still got the rest of the New Testament to go. We got 20 something more chapters of Acts. Is this good enough? Yeah. I'm not going to fight with the Lord over baptism. I'm not going to play semantic games. I'm not going to play junk. I'm not going to bring in religious creeds. I'm not going to bring in all that garbage. I'm going to take exactly what Peter said, and I'm going to do what Peter said, and then I become what Peter said. Right? Okay. Now, the question comes down to here. Are you one of the people in a crowd today that are on the other side, that are not included in that number with the saved. Look, you can do just like, just like these Jews did, these 3,000 did. You can do like many of us, I would say most of us here have done, and you can come down and you can repent, you can confess Christ as the Son of God, and we're glad to baptize. we got a nice baptistry. Full of water, warm water. But as soon as that happens, the Lord... Not any of us, the Lord adds you.
to the saved people. That's the list you want to be on when you draw your last breath. That's the list you want to be on as you travel through this pilgrimage toward one day when we depart. That's the only list to be on. You do not want to be on the other one. I hope and pray it is the case that these words are, are persuasive to you. I pray about these things fervently that I can be persuasive in teaching God's Word. I hope that you'll look at it. Look at it closely. If something I've said today doesn't make sense, by all means, you hit me up out. Don't hit me. Hit me up out in the back, and uh, we'll study it. We'll study it. Uh, we got no secrets here. We want you to know this book. We want you to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified because that's the only way we're all going to get to heaven. I hope if you need to respond, that you'll do so now while we stand and sing this song that Charlie's going to lead us in.